As I mentioned before, it's important that as a people we look back so we can know where we're going and what work there is to do. So we're going to throw it, what to me feels way back, to 1970 and hear from a man named Tom Skinner. Tom Skinner, also known as, by some as the prophet out of Harlem, got up in 1970 to speak about racism and white supremacy at InterVarsity's Historic Missions Conference, Urbana. Now, if you haven't been to Urbana before, it's about a 10,000 plus student and folks from around the world missions conference that helps people to wrestle with what their role is in God's global mission. So this isn't exactly the kind of place that you would expect an unapologetically black preacher to have space to speak just five years after black people won the right to vote. But InterVarsity took the risk knowing that black students needed a person and a vision to connect to. So we're going to hear a clip from a nearly one hour talk that he gave that invited people to take racism seriously and helped catalyze both InterVarsity's racial justice journey and the development of what we're experiencing now, Black Campus Ministries. So for our movement, listening to Tom again, it's a lot like coming home, but it's also like taking a hard and stark look at the work that we still have left to do. After this, the ever-talented ta ever Smiley Abrams will get up to share a poem with us to help us pull together everything that we're hearing. So y'all, for the next few minutes, get ready to experience history, challenge hope, and dissonance and beauty as we listen. The difficulty in coming to grips with the evangelical message of Jesus Christ in the black community is the fact that most evangelicals in this country who say that Christ is the answer will also go back to their suburban communities and vote for law and order candidates who will keep the system the way it is. Christ is the answer, but Christ has always been the answer through somebody. It has always been the will of God to saturate the common clay of a man's humanity and then send that man in open display in a hostile world as a living testimony that it is possible for the invisible God to make himself visible in a man. In this context, the question then becomes, how do you go in and communicate the message of Jesus Christ in which those people who proclaim Christ have participated in their oppression? Between the periods of 1865 and 1877, numerous black people were elected to state legislatures in South Carolina, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, and Louisiana. A black man was governor of the state of Louisiana in that period. The speakers of the House and the state legislatures in 1876 in South Carolina and Florida were black. Black politicians controlled numerous state legislatures throughout the South. Scores of them were elected to the United States Senate and Congress, and they began to make a tremendous upsurge in political power. But by 1877, there developed cries from certain sectors of society, which said that this former slave is moving too far too fast. They said he has only been free for 12 years. Does he expect to have all of his marbles in 12 years? These people must learn that these things take time. They must learn to be patient. They cannot have everything at once. Now that was 93 years ago. When was the last time you heard that statement? I had a problem with this guy, Jesus, because everything that I'd ever been told about Jesus Christ gave me the impression that he was some kind of softy. All the pictures of Christ were pictures of an Anglo-Saxon middle-class Protestant Republican. Until I discovered that the Christ which leaped out of the pages of the New Testament was a gutsy, contemporary, radical revolutionary with hair in his chest and dirt under his fingernails. The greatest accusation brought against Jesus was this man eats and drinks with sinners. If Jesus had chosen to walk the streets of our ghetto today, you could see him walking down Lenox Avenue at 125th Street. And there's a, little, there's a little short brother who can't see Jesus, so he climbs up on the fire escape so he can get a view of him. As he climbs the fire escape to get a view, Jesus spots him and says, Hey, Zach, what are you doing up there? Come on down, because today I've got to abide in your house. And I can see those Bible-believing fundamentalist Christians standing in the background saying, But, but Lord, you, you, you can't go to his house. You might lose your testimony. Now perhaps one of the great debates going on today are those people who resist the idea that Jesus was a revolutionary. But let's come to grips with what the Word of God says. 
first, the definition of a revolution is to take an existing situation which has proved to be unworkable, archaic, impractical, and out of date. You seek to destroy it or overthrow it and replace it with a system that works. The whole premise of the scripture is that the human order is archaic, impractical, it is no good. It is infested with demonic power, with sin, racism, hate, envy, jealousy, pride, war, militarism. But the whole existing human order is infested with ungodliness. And the whole purpose of Christ coming into the world is to overthrow the demonic human system and to establish his own kingdom in the hearts of men. The thing you must recognize is that Jesus Christ is no more a capitalist than he's a socialist or a communist. He's no more a Democrat than he's a Republican. He is no more the president of the New York Stock Exchange than he is the head of the Socialist Party. He is neither of that. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. And if you're going to respond to Jesus Christ, you must respond to him as Lord. A Christ who has come to overthrow the existing order and to establish a new order that is not built on man. Keep in mind, my friend, with all your militancy and radicalism, that all the systems of men are doomed to destruction. All the systems of men will crumble. And finally, only God's kingdom and his righteousness will prevail. You will never be radical until you become part of that new order and then go into a world that's enslaved. Jesus lost his testimony every day because he, he rubbed shoulders with people. And I challenge you that if you're talking about evangelism and you're talking about missions, you've got to be talking about going in the world. And the world is where the action is. Get away from this business of full-time Christian work and recognize that every last one of us are called to a mission. You may be called to be a business executive. Study, get your management principles down and infiltrate the business world for Jesus. You may be called to be an athlete, get out on the field and become an effective witness in the sports world. That is your mission field. You're going to be called to be a secretary, influence executives. You can influence America from those offices. 1619. Flee to America to be free. Indentured servant, seven years of labor, earned independence. 150 years before the Constitution, black people settled this land. We were an integral part of this society, blacks and whites, indentured servanthood equally, until white servants continued to flee, blended in with the dominant majority into race-based chattel slavery, upheld and enforced by three sectors in society, systemic structures establishing the foundation of the American dream, economy, black male reduced to property, value on the block, healthy if he could breed, stolen labor, forced immorality to feed the American greed together blended with politics this is what we see one percent controls the wealth of this country stocks the fortunate moral majority separate and unequal class hierarchy skin tone no hue no clue allegedly but completely an intentional divided states reduced to blue or red conservative politics in bed with white evangelicalism adultery Slave masters forcing sexual immorality for slaves to breed. Investments, property, oh, these were the Christians, the elders, the deacons, the pastors on the day of fasting who were doing as they pleased. Exploiting their workers, tightening the chains of injustice. I don't care about your religious feast. As brown bodies hang from trees, lower class blacks, no humanity, stuck in cells, laid on the street. Law and order? Is this justice? A mother can't sleep. Watching her baby lie. Blood bath, rat infested poverty, paying high rent to the slum lord who is an elder from the church down the street. Law and order, economic injustice, exploiting the poor, and they claim Jesus is the answer while doing drive by ministry, throwing some can feel goods out the window of their SUV so they can feel good as they cruise back to the safe suburbs, voting for the law and order candidates who perpetuate the broken system. Law and order, they mean all the order for us and all the law for them. No knock, stop and frisk, shoot first, being black as a weapon, school to prison pipeline, dense population like forcing a quarter in a dime. Yet they wonder why from the streets you hear black people cry, our lives matter. 
rage when no justice is served. Another black body lies murdered by those who vow to protect and serve. Nah, they just want to protect the property, not the dignity of human life. Shoot the looters. We can't lose the Walgreens. So, where's the hope? What exactly is the gospel? Christ is the answer, first and foremost. Christ is the answer lived out through people but we are told don't speak just shut up and dribble shut up and preach when jesus is hungry give him a bible when he is thirsty send him a sermon link when he is mourning from practical pain of systemic racism class-based wealth gap no vision just throw some water on him and get him saved make him say the magic prayer though his innocent body is unjustly rotten in jail just give him that passport to get out of hell extreme social justice without hope just bring food, never restoring dignity. The church has been silent. 50 years since Tom Skinner preached this word, Urbana 70. And yet, we see some of the same things. Evangelicals did not teach blacks how to value our humanity. It was Malcolm X and Brother Stokely, Rap Brown, where blackness was redeemed. That's why many like Tom wrote off Christianity as the white man's religion. But an honest read of scriptures, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, new humanity, Christ restores, Christ brings victory, not merely a list of rules and regulations, but in Christ's humiliation, we are set free. Faced with my human deprivation, my oppression, my mental and spiritual slavery, God breaks my yokes, my bondage, total liberation. So, who is this Jesus? Portraits paint him to be the Anglo-Saxon middle-class Protestant Republican with soft hands. As I read the scripture, I see Christ leap from the pages. He worked in construction, dirt under his fingernails, calluses on his feet, yet did not consider his equality with God to be used to his own advantage. Rather, made himself nothing, only walking in the authority of the Heavenly Father that allows us to stand in victory. Open our eyes. Who is the real enemy? Demonic oppression, racism, prejudice, blasphemy. They are stuck. They are oppressed. Chained down by their own hate, anger, and rage. We wrestle against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, we must recognize Jesus as Lord, Lord over heaven and earth, Lord over racism, Lord over injustice, Lord who sits with the sinner, Lord who loves the liberal, Christ who cares for the conservative. This is Jesus who came to shift the status quo, to change the system, to proclaim freedom to the captives, give sight to the blind, break the yoke of bondage from sin. Jesus the one and only begotten son holy spirit filled power to declare freedom preach the kingdom tell those who are bound the liberator has come